Okay, this is chapter 12, Work, from Gender Ideas, Interactions, Institutions, 2nd edition. Okay, so when we look at gender and work, the chapter really starts with the changing workplace after World War II. But what's interesting to note is that there's kind of a mythology that women started working after World War II, when in reality, lots of women were working before this. It's just the conditions in which they worked, the industries in which they worked, and the way in which they received pay is often what changed during the changing workplace. So many women, you know, from the advent of America have been working, but they were often the most poor, uh, women of color, people that didn't have privilege or status. So, but after World War II, again, we have this kind of changing of the roles. And what really changed was, it wasn't that women were working, it's that women were working in male-dominated industries that were legally restricted from women participating in them because women weren't considered suited for those jobs. So when men went to World War II and there were huge um, you know, issues of employment and needing women to fulfill those roles while men were fighting, you know, it basically broke down a lot of those expectations of what women could or couldn't do because you could no longer say, oh, women can't be a riveter, right? We have that Rosie the Riveter kind of idea because you could literally show women doing it. So it broke the stereotype or this understanding, the social expectation that women weren't capable of that kind of work. So again, this kind of changed the workplace and people's expectations of who could do what, but not initially, right? So the example the book talks about is how after World War II, airlines hired women because they believed they represented this ideal femininity to work as an airline stewardess, which we'll talk about a little bit later. We talk about emotion work, right? But it, what's interesting is, you know, by the 60s, it was kind of like part of going on a plane was the spectacle of the stewardess, right? That there were very strict standards of her appearance. Like she couldn't weigh over a certain amount if she was over, I can't remember the exact age, but it was like 30 something, like 32. It was like, you're out forever. Or maybe it was 30, <laughs> geez. But anyway, um, you know, there was an age limit. They had to wear high heels, right? And so they, well, actually that's still the case in most industries. So stewardesses faced routine sexual harassment but by being you know, at the same time, they were being very poorly paid, but there was this expectation that they would turn the sky into their living room, right? That they would transport the roles and expectations of the home, that women take care of people, provide them with food, comfort, safety, and emotional support, that that would then translate to a weird tin can in the sky that you're flying in this airplane, right? So it was pretty normal for stewardesses to face especially sexual harassment because they were literally put there as objects to entertain the people on the plane. So in 1964, stewardesses filed a case against the airline industry under the Civil Rights Act and basically said that companies should no longer have the right to pay women less, deny them promotions, or otherwise discriminate against them based on gender, right, using the protections of the Civil Rights Act. So the airline industry was a glamorous field with marketing and hiring practices that objectified stewardesses. There were bans on hook noses, right? Like your nose had to look a certain way. Um, this was a, again, it wasn't subtle. It was a clear way to try to keep Jewish women out of being stewardesses and trying to set a kind of standard of whiteness, of a white beauty standard as the norm for what stewardesses, what, what's acceptable and what's not. Uh, women were let go for a variety of personal reasons, like I said, turning 30, right, being one of them, um, getting married, you couldn't be a stewardess if you were not single, um, or if you became pregnant, right, because again, then you're not as good a sex object for the passengers to ogle. So, again, 1964 happens after this, and the stewardess has filed a, a case against the airline industry, and the power started to shift as a result of that landmark 1964 Civil Rights Act protections. So as more and more lawsuits mounted, a lot of those overly discriminatory practices slowly eroded. Though, again, like I said, it's still happening to this day, like just letting women be able to wear pants. And because now, remember, we've changed the nomenclature. No longer are people referred to as stewardesses. Um, you know, it's flight attendant, a, a very gender neutral term. So 
Some airline industries are more progressive than others and will allow people to wear like flats. Think about this, working like a 12 hour shift or sometimes if you're on a long flight, it could be 20 hours and you're forced the entire time to be smiling and in heels. Um, that's to me, <laughs> at least me personally, that would be torture. So at least being able to use like athletic shoes and not, you know, or flats and just not, you know, put strain and harm on your own back and knees and everything else while you're working is kind of a hard fought right for a lot of women in, in these industries. So or just even wearing pants, right? These things that are pretty taken for granted in the current era. So again, that's just one example. But I'm sure you could think of other industries that have also been impacted in, in many ways because of the 1964 Civil Rights Act. As those protections came into place, they gave an avenue for people to sue for recrimination, and as a result, offered much more equitable workspaces after. Again, though, as we'll talk about, there's still a lot of issues that remain. One of which is the gender pay gap. So men continue to have substantial advantages in the workplace today. The most succinct measure of men's advantage is the gender pay gap which is the difference between the incomes of the average man and the average woman who work full-time. So full-time working women at this point, well, at least the figure from the book is 2017, were making about 82 cents to every male dollar. But remember, this is further stratified by social class, by race, and other factors, that kind of intersectionality, right? So, but there is an overall issue of a gender pay gap, right? When you kind of amalgamate all the data, you still find that women make about 82 cents for every dollar that a man makes. So this is the result of men having substantial advantages in the workplace, particularly class privilege, white men. So those men are more likely to engage in paid work than women. They're more likely to work more hours per week and more weeks per year. They get better benefits and are more likely to have on the job training and they're most likely to have jobs that are considered skilled or to be in management positions that make large, you know, six-figure salaries. So again, we'll talk about this a little bit more in depth later, but, you know, or actually on the same slide in a minute, <laughs> but when we really look at the gender pay gap, we also have to look at how much this is stratified by, you know, social class, by race, by other intersectional factors. So it's not just about men and women, it's also about types of men and types of women and different groups that and how they interact in that kind of economic hierarchy. So moving on to gender job segregation. Gender job segregation is the practice of filling occupations with mostly male or mostly female workers. This is another impact on that pay gap. So occupations are socially constructed to suggest that they're best suited for stereotypical women or stereotypical men. Because jobs are not naturally gendered, we find a great variation across cultures. So the segregation found in jobs is not natural. For example, medicine is considered a female job in Russia and Finland, as is dentistry in Latvia. Women dominate computer science in Malaysia. In India, where women are held primarily responsible for the home, the construction industry is made up primarily of women. So when you think about it, what occupations do you think of as feminine? What occupations do you think of as masculine? Why? Well, largely because they've been socially constructed for us to believe them that way. And oftentimes you can tell when something has been socially constructed in such a way, when there's a moniker like female pilot or male nurse, if you have to say the gender before it, then you're basically saying that that job is assumed to be like, you know, nurse is assumed to be female and pilot is assumed to be male. So just how much segregation is there? Well, figure 12.2 from your book looks at some of the most gender segregated occupations. So if you look at those, you'll see that the female do dominated occupations are jobs like speech language pathologist, which is 98% female, preschool and kindergarten teacher, 98% female, dental hygienist, 95% female, secretary and administrative assistant, 95% female, dietitian and nutritionist, 94% female, child care worker, 94% female, hairdresser, hairstylist, and cosmetologist, 93%, medical records and health information technician, 92%, medical assistant, 92%, receptionist and information clerk, 91% female, registered nurse, 90%, and nursing, psychiatric, and home health aid, 89%. So that's pretty female, those positions. And then when looking at the male-dominated occupations from 12.2 in your book, you see 
that roofer is 99% male, automotive service technician and mechanic, 98%, carpenter, 98%, firefighter, 97%, construction, 97%, crane or tower operator, 96%, maintenance and repair worker, 96%, welder, 96 truck driver, 94 grounds or maintenance worker, 94 pest control worker, 94 and mechanical engineer, 91. And again, this information was just taken from the Bureau of Labor Statistics to kind of look at some of these very gendered, um, you know, are basically dominated fields by certain genders. So what examples of female, what are those examples of those female dominated jobs or the male dominated jobs? When you think about them, are you surprised by those lists? Not necessarily. When you think about it, a lot of those jobs, like for instance, the fact that 98% of all preschool and kindergarten teachers are female, right? That's very strongly connected with gendered expectations of women, that women like to be around little kids and take care of small children and that they're well suited in some biological way to do so really affects then the kind of position that they get funneled into, right? Versus an automotive service technician and mechanic, right? The idea that cars are for men and you know, mechanics get dirty and all of these kind of things are very suited for a, a very stereotypical masculine approach. So it's not that there aren't females that are mechanics, it's just that only 2%, right? Or the same thing, there's not, there's not kindergarten or preschool teachers that are male, but it's only 2% of which. So it shows that the gendered expectations of the roles of the job affect who ends up in what positions. So looking at causes of job segregation, again, that socialization hypothesis, men and women are responding to gender stereotypes when they plan or train or apply for jobs, that they kind of think of what's best suited for them is really narrowed by their gender identity. So the employer, the employer selection hypothesis also proposes that employers tend to prefer men for more masculine jobs and women for more feminine jobs. So that also accounts for who ends up in what position. Another hypothesis is the selective exit hypothesis that highlights workers' abandonment of counter-stereotypical occupations. Because oftentimes, being in a counter-stereotypical occupation, you're gonna face a, a big uphill you know, kind of hurdle that you have to work against the expectations that you don't belong there. And that causes a lot more extra you know, stress and strain to somebody, not only to do their job, but to do it and prove to other people that they deserve to be there. So through a complicated congruence of socialization, employer selection, and selective exit, men and women usually end up in very gender stereotypical jobs. So hypermasculine culture has been cited as one of the reasons for women leaving computer science jobs, while assumptions behind jobs being dominated by men or women may leave the status quo untouched. So if you think about the career you'd like to pursue after graduating from college, you know, do you think you were socialized in any way towards that career? If so, how were you socialized towards that career? Or how does that connect to what's acceptable for your own gender? All right, looking at different and equal. When men were hired as flight attendants, stewards, right? The job embodied professionalism and dignity. But when flight attendants were overwhelmingly female and were stewardesses, the role was reimagined. So the seriousness of the job is downplayed and the subordinate role of supportive and sometimes sexually playful service was very played up. So it's kind of similar to the cheerleading example that the book gives, right? For, I think it's chapter six and seven, that talks about how when cheerleading was a male dominated pursuit, it was considered a sport. It was considered, you know, not frivolous and the men didn't wear little skimpy costumes and, you know, shake their bits around. But when cheerleading became a female dominated position, it was no longer regarded as a sport, considered more frivolous and is much more about how sexy the portrayal is of the person doing it more so than, you know, the actual athleticism and flexibility and strength that goes into doing those kind of things. So it's similar to that with the kind of steward stewardess dynamic. So gender job segregation is important to understand, right? If you want to understand why there is such pay inequity, it's, you know, part of this is gender job segregation, right? Meaning if you're in a male dominated industry, the pay tends to reflect that versus being in a female dominated industry, the pay tends to reflect that. So sometimes it's not about equal pay for equal work because people aren't working in the same positions, right? So another problem though we'll talk about too is that women are often treated differently and unequally in the workforce. Just like with cheerleading, when women became more 
of the flight attendants, you had this male flight from the job position, and it became, you know, the composition of flight attendants switched from male to female pretty quickly. All right, looking at the androcentric pay scale, this is just shows that the prestige and pay associated with jobs tend to follow the sex of the job. So as women enter an occupation, the status goes down, while as men enter an occupation, the status goes up. And so the status is related to how much you get paid. So the androcentric pay scale is a strong correlation between wages and gender composition of jobs. So according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, the gender composition of a job is the single largest contributor to the gender wage gap. Okay, so briefly before moving on, I wanted to go over figure 12.3, which is gender and race composition in the highest paying jobs in the United States, right? Which is another figure in your book that looks at how the highest paid occupations tend to be, you know, um, more than 50% male and, you know, overwhelmingly white, right? So for example, the first Example given is physicians and surgeons that make over $214,000 a year, 60% of which are male and 66% of which are white, right? Or if you look at chief executives, this is even more, you know, um, kind of stark. So this is, you know, making around $200,000 a year, 72% um, are male and 86% are white. So as you look down figure 12.3, you can start to see certain patterns of which jobs have high pay and the likelihood of that position being dominated by men and being dominated by white men, right? So for example, you have air aircraft pilots and flight engineers, 94% male, 88% white. They make about $138,000 a year. So you see that a lot of these positions are dominated by these groups or at least have a large proportion of of that group, you know, so there are a few that are under 50%, you know, but like for instance, um, if you look at training and development managers, about $117,000 a year, you see 40% are male, but 81% are white. So even when women are present, they are white women. They are people that have more privilege. So this is where that kind of intersectionality comes into play, that it's not just about gender, it's also about race, ethnicity. It's also about social class and all of these other factors that intertwine to create this kind of unequal situation that we face. Okay, so looking at the value of gendered work, oftentimes so many skills, you know, for instance, the flight attendant example that they have, are, some of their skills are invisible to most of us, most of the time, both by circumstance and design. So as a result, we tend to dismiss the work that we see as unskilled so we don't think about, you know, especially for, oh man, it's crazy. The kind of job that being a flight attendant is like, if the plane's going down, you're literally told you have to just keep smiling and acting like everything's fine. <laughs> I mean, that's who, like that's a job stressor. So the work that's associated though with most feminine jobs is often invisible or just viewed as unskilled. So flight attendants must, for example, learn hundreds of regulations and all sorts of features of multiple types of airplanes so that they can keep people safe and kind of understand how to navigate through these, you know, particular airplanes. So they know how to evacuate a plane on land or sea within 90 seconds. Um, they know how to keep a heart attack or stroke victim alive and how to calm or restrain an anxious, aggressive, or mentally ill passenger. As we've seen in a lot of YouTube things lately, duct tape helps, <laughs> right? They also do something that's considered the most, I think, laborious of the entire thing, which is managing the emotions of incredibly unhappy and frustrated groups of airline passengers. But they're just still thought of as sky waitresses, right? So emotion work is this problem. It's really fascinating when you look at the kind of, um, you know, the term emotion work came from research that was looking specifically at flight attendants and talking about the expectations that they had to kind of treat everyone like they're a guest in their home and their home is a tin box in the sky. So the emotion work is referring to, you know, controlling your own emotions and managing the emotions of others. This is so important. I'm sure if you've ever worked retail, then you've done emotion work, right? Where someone comes up and they're screaming and you're like, well, hi, sir, how can I help you? Well, how can I make this a pleasant day for you, <laughs> right? This kind of thing where you're supposed to, emotion work really, it's like either holding back your emotions so you don't tell people how you really think, or, this kind of trying to placate this person so that you can control their emotions so that they don't, you know, freak out. 
So flight attendants are tasked with seamlessly performing all the proper emotions and interactions with an impossible wide range of people who bring their own emotions to every moment. So how easy is it to perform emotion work? It's not, right? It takes a lot of energy, right? I'm sure you can think of other jobs that require a lot of emotion work, right? And think about it, like a job like, again, a preschool teacher, a kindergarten teacher, that requires a ton of emotion work. If I was in a room with 30 little kids, <laughs> I want to think I could handle it, but I'm pretty sure I would scream at them. Like I, um, aside, sorry, I work at a public library and for years, um, I do mostly teen programs, but for years, especially when covering for other people from maternity leave, I did story time with little kids, like kids that are like under four and then groups that were coming in from elementary schools that were kindergartners and first graders. And for me, it was really interesting seeing the dynamics of the teachers and how they dealt with the children. Most of the teachers had this very emotion work, perfect visage. I don't know how they did it where it was like, one, two, three, eyes on me, and everybody line up, boys and girls, you know, this kind of weird, um, kind of saccharine voice, and really sweet, and dealt with the kids, you know, problems very tactfully. And then there was one teacher, <laughs> I guess I could put her on blast, she already retired, Miss Almgren, and she would scream bloody murder at these children, like little kindergartners, she'd just scream at them. And I wonder, Ooh, would that be me? Would that be me after 30 years of dealing with those kids? Right? Because again, it's another approach. It's not emotion work because she didn't care if she hurt their little feelings or any of that. But the expectation for that job is emotion work is even though a kid is, you know, six and they're having a tantrum, you're supposed to be like, Billy, what do we do when this happens? Right? You're supposed to have all of this kind of extra care and attention. And so when you think about it, those jobs that deal with a lot of emotion work are often gendered as feminine because the expectation is women are the ones that should have to just kind of grin and bear it and deal with the emotion work. Okay, so looking at some of the um, care work that's done. So care work, it's this kind of devaluation of feminized occupations that's specific for care work, which involves face-to-face -face caretaking, either physical, emotional, or educational caretaking. So this is typically of children, the elderly, or the sick. And these jobs are paid even less than other feminized jobs. And, you know, whether, whether or not, and this is even true when you control for education and training. So the gender devaluation is especially apparent in care work. These jobs are paid so much less. For example, the average yearly income for a child care worker is less than $23,000 or $23,760 per year. So when you look at men's work compared to women's work, job segregation contributes to the gender pay gap because we attribute more value to men's work than to women's work. So an occupation that's disproportionately filled with women is seen as legitimately lower paid because it's you know not dominated by men. So this means that both men and women can lose prestige and income if they're in a feminine occupation. So job segregation doesn't just create differentiated workforces, it creates an unequal one. Women working in predominantly female occupations earn 26% less than women working in male occupations. However, although job segregation explains a large part of the pay gap, it doesn't explain all of it. Some of this just comes down to discrimination and preferential treatment. So another figure from your book is figure 12.5, which looks at women's earnings of every dollar of men's in the 20 most common occupations for women and men. So when you look at Basically, how much women make to the male dollar. If it's a female-dominated position, it's pretty close. But if it's a male-dominated position, it's pretty low. So, for example, at the top of the list was registered nurse, which is 91 cents to the male dollar on average, right? Versus down near the bottom, you have driver, sales worker, or truck driver is 73 cents to that dollar. So it kind of justifies this idea that if women are in some of these more male occupations, that they shouldn't get the same pay equity as men within those same positions. So it's no longer legal to discriminate based on gender, right? But discrimination didn't simply vanish. There's pay gaps in professions today, some of which are due to discrimination, and sexism itself is very prevalent in the workforce still. So benevolent sexism is discrimination in the form of chivalry, where men attempt to protect women from the unpleasant, dirty, confrontational, or dangerous, or otherwise unfeminine activities, and in doing so, end up undermining women's career trajectories. So when asked, 22% of men and 42% of women reported being the victim of gender discrimination at work, 
with women in male-dominated workplaces the most likely to say so. So both men and women report being the victim of gender discrimination at work, but women are considerably more likely to report it. Discrimination includes being treated as incompetent, being passed over for good assignments or promotions, and silenced, slighted, or isolated. So this also can include receiving less support from supervisors. So benevolent sexists may be trying to be nice, but they hurt female employers when they protect them and prevent them from learning their jobs or demonstrating their skills or becoming better and more effective employees. So then moving on to hostile sexism, right? Hostile sexism, it's much more direct sexism. And so hostile sexism, in some occupations, some men feel strongly that women should stay in the home or shouldn't be doing men's work. So they isolate women or put them in more dangerous situations. And hostile se sexism can be sexual. So sexual harassment is just a reassertion of dominance in response to the entrance of women into jobs which men feel entitled to. So women are a symbolic threat. Their presence potentially degrades the identity of the dominant group. Okay, so looking further at gender inequality in work, another issue is the double bind. This is something that women often face in masculine occupations, is to be successful at a job, a woman needs to do masculinity, but also be accepted by her boss, colleagues, and clients, so she has to do femininity. It's this kind of balance, right? So feminine women are seen as likable, but incompetent, while women who do masculinity are seen as competent, but not likable. So there's a balancing act that women have to achieve. They must display enough masculinity to prove they can do the job, but still appear feminine enough to be tolerated by their male coworkers. All right, then looking at the glass ceiling, so the costs of hostile benevolent sexism and the double bind are behind the idea of the glass ceiling, this invisible barrier between women, people of color, trans folks, or people that aren't cisgendered men, and the top positions in masculine occupations. So most women simply don't get the training, mentorship, or promotions that are received by many men. And especially black and Latina women are even more likely than white or Asian women to encounter a glass ceiling. On average, men enter the workforce with higher salaries and advance at a quicker pace. Nearly three quarters of successful female executives in the Fortune five or 1000 companies agree that gender stereotypes are a barrier to women's success. So again, black and Latina women often face what's called a concrete ceiling instead of glass. Stereotypes such as the angry black woman or the hot-blooded Latina that permeate our culture doubly penalize women of color for a lack of white femininity. So another concept that's important is the glass cliff. When women do break through a ceiling, they often encounter a glass cliff, a heightened risk of failing compared to similar men. So women tend to be promoted during times of crisis and given jobs that have a higher risk of failure. Because of the glass cliff, the average tenure of female CEOs is half that of male CEOs. If women succeed in these precarious positions, their reward is generally to be put in charge of another fragile project. They may burn out from stress or feel dissatisfied. So if a woman does leave an executive position, some may say that she just couldn't handle the pressure, when in fact she was put in a position that was much more likely to fail. And then when you look at men in female-dominated positions, instead of facing a glass ceiling or cliff, men in female-dominated occupations are often presented with what's called a glass escalator, right? An invisible ride to the top that's offered to men in female-dominated positions. So men in female-dominated occupations are advantaged in terms of pay, promotions, and support from colleagues and supervisors who tend to be male themselves. So males in female-dominated occupations don't face nearly the same struggles as women do in male-dominated occupations. Glass escalators create pathways for men to management positions and higher roles. But again, not all men view this as a blessing. Gender stereotypes also harm men in these positions. Okay, so moving on to the ideal worker norm. The ideal worker norm is the idea that an employee should commit their energy to their job without distraction of family responsibilities. So this is the norm that's especially strong in the United States, right? As we've discussed a little bit before, in other countries, they just don't have these same kind of binaries, right? You can be a good parent and be a good worker. But here it's like capitalism says, nope, <laughs> your family doesn't mean as much as your job. So it assumes that workers have homemaker partners, right? Meaning or, or paid help to take care of their family or house-related demands, 
right? So if both partners are working, which is predominantly the case within the United States, then who cleans the house? Who cooks the dinners? Who gets the groceries? I mean, I don't know about you. If you work and go to school and all of this, then, you know, you have a similar life to mine where you have like that one day off and that day is like laundry and cleaning and then you go right back to the grind, right? So not having a, uh, you know, a maid at home or like an au pair or someone to take care of your kids or do any of these things makes it very difficult because the entire capitalist economy relies upon the unpaid labor of women, the expected, you know, roles of women to just kind of fulfill all of those unpaid things. So again, the ideal worker norm is just the idea that employed people should have no attachments that take away from their work and that doing a good job is not enough. So in Northern Silicon Valley, this has been informally quantified as drag coefficients. An apartment in San Francisco that's an hour commute from Silicon Valley is considered a full unit of drag. So spouses are also considered drag coefficients and children are a half point each, right? So it's pretty sad that they turn it into like a mathematical equation of like, you're not gonna be a good job unless you live right next to your work and have no spouse, no children, nothing but your job, right? Um, that's not how people's lives tend to actually work. So women with children particularly bear the brunt of straining to live up to the ideal worker norm. Mothers often suffer what's called a motherhood penalty which is a loss in wages per hour from the job associated with becoming a mother. While fathers, ironically on the other end, receive a fatherhood premium, a wage increase that accrues to married men who become fathers. The idea is, oh, they became more responsible. But for the woman, even though she's taken on more responsibility and roles at home, she's not considered more responsible. She's considered less the ideal worker norm. So the ideal worker norm is often very gendered. You know, in chapter 11, we talked about how mothers tend to take on more of the second shift work, taking more time away from paid work, which impacts the ideal worker norm. So the motherhood penalty and the fatherhood premium are just the result of both time and effort spent on work, even more so the employer's belief about what's appropriate for time in work. So again, this is why women with children suffer particularly under that model. And another concept of this is the mommy track. So if you're struggling with work-life balance, mothers may allow themselves to be put on the mommy track, which is a workplace euphemism that refers to expecting less commitment from mothers. But this also comes with the understanding that they're sacrificing the right to expect equal pay, regular raises, or promotions. Because the idea is, well, you're just not as caring of, of a worker because you're gonna go home to your family or you want Saturday off so you can go to little Billy's soccer game or whatever it is instead of pulling a double shift on Saturday or showing that you're a good worker by working all these extra hours. So in contrast to mothers though, fathers often increase their effort at work. And this choice likely resonates from their employer's gendered ideology. So studies actually find that many mothers do put in great amounts of effort at work and some evidence suggests that they're even more productive than non-mothers. So this is consistent with the finding that the biggest contributor to the motherhood penalty and the fatherhood premium isn't how mothers and fathers actually perform at work, but rather their employers and their coworkers' beliefs about how they perform. So looking at beliefs about moms and dads, research shows that many employers see mothers as less than ideal employees and fathers as especially ideal ones, regardless of the talent and effort of those actual employees and what they display at work. So again, going back to before, those mothers are facing a double bind. The more motherly they behave, the less we value them. So for example, breastfeeding mothers are judged to be less competent, yet if they aren't maternal enough, they face judgment as well. So not wanting to go home early to be with their child may be perceived as being neglectful. So it's a double bind, like you can't, there's no winning, basically. <laughs> You're damned if you do, damned if you don't. So compared to the mid 20th century, most employees today work harder for less money. That's just a feature of our economy that we've kind of discussed a little bit. So the economy is now characterized by a commitment to the free market and the expense of protecting workers, which results in low levels of regulation and the suppression of union activity, which might actually cause more pay equity, raise wages, give more vacation time, God forbid, paid family leave, things of this nature. You know, this, these are just common practices in other countries that if you have a bowling ball of a baby burst out of your body, you get like half a year to recover from that and spend time with your baby as they develop. In this country, you know, um, nationally, paid family leave is part of kind of more or recent 
changes, which would only limit that to four weeks if it passes. Um, nationally right now, there's a 12 week Family Medical Leave Act that pays you nothing. So some states have something like California provides six weeks paid maternity leave. Um, some employers provide it, but most of those employers only provide it to people who are full time under certain conditions. And the fact that overwhelmingly, most people are working gig economy or part-time jobs, even if they are working 38 hours a week and so that they don't have to give them benefits or, you know, those kind of financial um, incentives like, you know, retirement benefits, medical benefits, vacations, things like this. It's just not the way that that works in other countries, especially in other countries with similar economic development as us, like Europe where they have you know, weeks paid vacation every year, like France. Every worker gets six weeks paid vacation, even if they're part-time, right? That's just, that doesn't happen here. They're working like a 35 to 30 hour work week while we're working you know, a 40 to 60 hour work week. So in the US, wages have been stagnant since the 70s. And some of the drops in the pay gap between men and women has, have often been the result of men losing pay, not women gaining pay. So when we talk about gender equity in work, we don't mean the equity of having no money, <laughs> right? We mean the equity of having status and jobs that actually pay enough to support your family. And, you know, just to give people a decent quality of life, especially when they're spending so much of their life laboring for some other employer. So the workplace has changed through a combination of government policies, reduced regulation, all of these things have affected the attitude towards employees and customers. And so as employers share less and less of the firm's profits, today's workers enjoy less pay, less flexibility and security, fewer benefits. And so again, labor unions have declined and collective bargaining strength workers used to use has decreased, which means they can't get the protection. If you go and ask your boss for a raise, they can just be like, no. But if you and thousands of your other you know, co-workers go and ask for a raise and say, well, we're not going to work until we get it, then you actually will get that raise. Right. We're seeing this across the country right now. There's so many uh, labor movements that are, have you know, jumped up trying to demand a lot of fairness that has been lost for almost 40 years in this country. Right. And we can see that we're in a situation where there's more economic inequality now than ever before in American society. And that also tracks with the fact that there's some of the lowest union membership in history since unions, since the union movement came about. So there is a direct correlation between no unions and, you know, horrible issues of inequality in the economy in the workplace. So just to wrap up, women are less successful for a complex set of reasons, right? As we talked about, it's not just about, you know, the amount of pay, it's about the, the you know, it could be the gender job segregation itself. You know, the pay gap itself is a problem, but also the discrimination that people face, right? So about 10% of the pay gap is explained by differences in job experience due to time spent in and out of the workforce. So think about that. If you have to take time out of work and you don't get paid for it, like you have to like quit your job or put your job on hold to have children, but a male doesn't have to do that and they can still have children and not have to put their jobs and, and lives on hold, they're not going to have the same gaps in their resume or have the same kind of, you know, struggle with getting the promotions and tenure and long term kind of positions that men might be able to get. Also, about half of the inequality is explained by job segregation and the devaluation of women's work. And once an industry is dominated by women, the pay tends to just scale downward. And so the remaining 41% of the issue is likely due to discrimination. So it's still an issue that we need to combat head on and make sure that people have actual fairness and equity within work.